Um, I think I'd like to start with a story. I'm assuming that many of you listening in, I can't see you, but I assume many of you are actually Irish. Um, so when I arrived in Northern Ireland in 1976 and started having a family, I literally ended up in a place called the Killing Zone because it was the second highest murder rate in Northern Ireland. The first was a one square mile within Belfast. And therefore we had all the time, we had helicopters overhead from the army. We had um, lots of sort of bombs going off within a few miles around us, et cetera. But one particular day really started me on the work when I opened the door and found some soldiers there looking for um, what they said. They wanted to know, had any, was anybody in my house? And I couldn't figure out what they were asking. And I suddenly remembered that I had actually seen the IRA practicing in my back window a few minutes before that. And I thought, aha, that's who they're after. And I thought the, these soldiers, they were so young. There was somebody who was in their 30s, but mostly they were 17 or 18. And mostly they were men who had joined up because they couldn't get another job. Um, and I looked out my window and I saw the young IRA men who couldn't get a job because they were Catholics in Northern Ireland. And there you had the, the challenge of two young bands of men basically setting out to kill each other because in fact of the way their societies had treated them. And that was a really interesting lesson and, and that sort of led to many of the questions that I ask in terms of um, uh, starting my lecture now in terms of looking at the book. Okay, so when, this is my Okay, you'll see here that this is part of the cover of my book, which as Leah has kindly said, will be available. Un Most academics books are actually far too expensive for individuals to buy. So make sure that the, um, uh, that the uh, library buys it for you. Okay, so there's this, uh, the cover of it. And that incident between the soldiers and watching the young IRA, IRA men le led to me to ask a whole variety of questions about what was happening in Northern Ireland. And in fact, led to my becoming involved in what was happening there as I did for probably approximately the next 10, 15 years. And the questions were, you know, how come um, that it happens that conflicts erupt so easily? Um, you can see, for instance, I remember following Bosnia at the same time. And families who'd lived together for generations, suddenly they became enemies and suddenly they were prepared to kill each other. Um, the other thing that struck me was that why was it that in certain situations there were more people who found themselves afraid and prejudiced against other people? And that became obvious as I moved around the world, involving myself in many of the conflicts that there were. Particularly the, the loss, I have two young children myself, both of whom were boys and they both of whom are boys. And the whole question of why people are so willing to actually sacrifice their lives for a cause that will bring them no material goods in many cases, but just some ideals that they're, follow they're following. And this one, why facts matter so little in conflicts. I mean, most of you have probably been following the situation in the United States, where many people found it hard to accept the fact that Joe Biden had actually won. Why was that so problematic for so many, particularly many whom you would see as being educated and intelligent? Now, the reason I was asking these questions was, um, I don't know whether you've been working on theories of change, which are the way people change their mind and their behavior in a society. Now, it's very important that you actually understand why people do things before you decide upon your theories of change. So if in fact you believe that all people who are extremists are psychopaths, then you'd have a very different approach than if you think of them as people who are responding to inequalities. So it's actually quite important that we understand why conflicts do erupt so easily and why they continue. Now, I'm sure we've probably got some people who've done politics. And as you know, the, uh, the traditional paradigm in politics is actually emphasizing the role of the state, you know, the national interest of the state and power in world politics. And that has been the main paradigm for, oh, as long as politics, uh, political studies have been in existence. The problem is that many people who are undertaking politics at the moment are very confused because those paradigms are not fitting what we call the new wars of today, which are much more likely to be about identity and internal inequalities and exclusions. So I've actually met, I remember I, I work in, in Boston, I met, happened to meet the head of the Harvard International Politics, and he was saying basically they have very few ways of looking at these new wars, mostly because their stuff is about power, but this stuff doesn't seem to be about power, he said. And, you know, it brings up this question, how do you argue with a suicide bomber? It's not what you ask, giving him material goods. It's so difficult to actually think about how you can address the, the emotions of people who involve themselves in the new wars. 
So I came across then an experiment that actually opened up something for me. It had happened because early in my time in Northern Ireland, I got interested in doing dialogue work between different groups, partly because I was living in the middle of a conflict. And I remember bringing together a group of SDLP, that's one of the sort of the nonviolent political parties at that stage in Northern Ireland, and a group of Presbyterian ministers who were Protestant. So here we were, and I was hoping we'd have a conversation between why people feel so badly about each other, et cetera. And we just about got around the introductions when one of the participants who was a Presbyterian minister stood up and he said, and he literally had tears in his voice. He said, Mary, this is ridiculous. We know why we're here, he said, basically because you, pointing to the Catholics, want us to go home to Scotland. But we left there 300 years ago and we have nowhere to go. And he literally did break down and cried. Now, just imagine the difference that that made to the STLP, who representing Catholics had always seen the Protestant side as those who had the power, those who had excluded Catholics, made sure they didn't get the housing or the political um, opportunities or the public um, office and uh, work uh, uh, employment opportunities. Think what difference that made to them when they looked at this man whom they'd always seen as representative of those people with power and saw that what he was, was afraid. And I began to look up then, how do you deal with people? Um, how do you argue with people who are afraid? And there was a very interesting piece of neuroscience that I came across, which showed, um, a, a, again, one person talking to another. And they were trying to put in place with people who had particular convictions, something that really challenged what they believed. And they had their heads wired up to the MRI. And what they discovered was that when you put in front of people something that really contradicts what they hold dearly, what happens is they don't change their mind, they just freeze. So I became interested in what else could neuroscience um, tell me about in terms of the whole quest of peace building, which was and is my main focus. And I discovered the, the whole question of neuroscience, which actually helps us to understand other things in their genes or biology that will affect how we think and behave. In other words, if our brains freeze when we're faced with contradictions to our deeply held beliefs, what does that actually mean in terms of the hardware of the body? So I discovered, in fact, it was a burgeoning field. I became interested probably seriously, you know, about a decade ago. These are the new uh, sciences that are emerging. And for those of you who are thinking about how you might proceed in terms of sociology, it's happening there too. So neuromarketing is where, you know, pretty well every business today looks at neuromarketing and neuromarketing is based on the idea that people don't buy things very often rationally. They often buy things from emotions. So much of the advertising is done is to get at your emotions rather than necessarily get at your logic. Neuroeconomics and the World Trade Organization, or sorry, the World Bank, that should be not the World Trade Organization. It now brought out, it now works on the basis of neuroscience. It brought out a fascinating um, really in-depth paper on using neuroscience to address issues of development and um, brought it out about five years ago. So they're basically saying, okay, what is it in the behavior of people rather than their logic that we can actually use to make our work more successful? There's even a, a, a neuro um, theology um, uh, science now has been developed as well, neuro law, etc. And this is where I'm saying that neurosociology seems to be joining the field because I see frontiers in sociology those of you who are planning on an academic career will know that one of the curses of your life will be finding places to publish your work. Well, here's the, <clears throat> the frontiers in sociology are looking for submissions by April 2021 on the whole question of neurosociology, which they see as a new field for transdisciplinary social analysis. I mean, <clears throat> Professor David was talking about the usefulness of multidisciplinary uh, studies, and I absolutely agree with her. And this is a combination of neuroscience and sociology. So good luck with those. You never know, you might get a job on the basis of publications in, in Frontiers in Sociology. What I discovered was that there was very little for the peace building field and hence my current work. Now, the advantage of neuroscience, as opposed to the traditional um, me um, mechanisms of I'm a social psychologist or a sociology, is that often we ask people about their ideas about things. But as we all know, as we notice a slight hesitation, as we do our own surveys, that often we're shaping what we say in accordance with the way we want to be seen. The great thing about the machinery, such as functional magnetic resonance, fMRI, um, electromyography, DNA, genetic hormonal testing, is that you actually can't cheat on them. 
if you are wired up to an fmi machine it actually is very clearly indicating which parts of your brains are responding so it actually gets us beyond the um the problem that we have on terms of uh, self-observation etc those are the sections of the book as i say it'll be coming out probably may june i can never understand why these books take so some of these books take so long to get published but as i say um hope, hopefully you can get your library to buy a copy of it for you so this is one of my favorite um uh, slides because even i've looked at it so many times but i am still struck with wonder this of course is the brain everything that happens in the world and your world is because of your brain every thought you think every emotion you have every decision you make and um, the children that you have all are based on the kind of brain that you have what the brain can do etc a most wondrous of human organs of which we know not that much at all and that's where i hasten to say my book would probably i think i had 75 pages of medical scientific references to it but the first uh, comment i made as i began the ending of the book was to say we are really just in the beginning in terms of what we know so those of you who are interested there's plenty of room if you're interested in progressing your neuroscience uh, approach to any of your disciplines because it really is just in the beginning just very simply telling you the way we look at it in terms of our approach to peace building is there basically two parts to your brain and those of you who are scientists i know i know it's simplification but we talk about the amygdala and we talk about the cortex now the amygdala is mainly responsible for your feelings your happiness your fear your aggression anger and your memory and your memory memory is very interesting um it turns out that memory is more about um our current need rather than necessarily about the past and i'll come to that when we come to looking at peace building and then following on about half a second later your brain your cortex front lobes begin to come into play and these are about um taking account of what you're looking at who are you listening to what are they saying and you're trying to think what does sense does this make for how i respond what i do in the future it gives you the pause as it were for doing some thinking about right wrong thinking about what does this mean in terms of what i do in the future etc um there's a, one of my favorite authors is a man called Jonathan Haith and he uses this to explain the way the amygdala and the cortex work together unfortunately as you may not have guessed but this little fellow on the top is actually your cortex and the rest of the elephant the whole of the elephant just marching away is your amygdala now i know i'm talking to a group of either you know uh, university students or perhaps university faculty and you of course believe that you sitting on the top you are much more powerful than that certainly much more powerful than most other people but i have to say to you even those of us who spend a lot of our time using our brains and by the way i think that's why some of our disciplines are so narrow because we are people who are trained to use our brains and that is a problem we can we can't quite remember how powerful emotions are but let me ask you do you remember falling in love and how irrational that was do you remember losing your temper and thinking oh oh why did i lose my temper what happened do you remember being at the side of a football field those of you who are fo a football uh, lovers male female uh, and screaming your head off and thinking oh my gosh if my colleagues saw me they would wonder what was up with me if you have been in a riot and i had both been in riots and had many students who've been in riots and in fact something very often does take over you um so much so that you sometimes can wonder afterwards how did i do that and if you ever worked with a passionately committed group how that felt this is where your emotions tend to be um, affect very much um the decisions that you make okay folks i'm trying to get on to the, okay so the thing to remember is that our in both our individual and our group emotions are often governed by the biological influences that take control and they run an automatic response that's called what we have call an amygdala hijack or an emotional hijack and that's what happened in all of those things what happened was your logical brain uh, ceased to function very effectively and you're taken over by emotions now those of you who've been doing a lot of reading recently particularly in in psychology and social psychology may have come across Kahneman's book thinking fast and slow that just came out a few years ago but it fits so well with what I've been saying in terms of the amygdala and in terms of the cortex so he calls system 1 
it operates automatically, quickly and instinctually. And that is the first one that operates previously to operating consciously, uh, which makes us think about, well, what does this mean? It's actually half a second, and we've known this by the machines we've used, before we begin to think consciously, our amygdala comes into play pretty well always. And that actually sometimes stops us in our tracks and actually means we don't go much further than that. Um, and if we do go further, we will often remember that feeling and we'll find logical reasons that will uphold our moral or other thinking. So in other words, the very way we feel is often responsible for what we do, even though we don't quite understand why, that in fact, we've often bypassed our cortex. However, um, the thing to remember is that our brains differ uh, along how they respond to the, our amygdala. So you have a whole continuum and some people will respond much faster than others. And this is one of the things you need to remember if you go into somewhere like our field, the whole question of um, the, the sociology or the psycho, uh, psychology of social change, that people come with differences towards uncertainty and fear. And scans can show us these differences and genetics and hormones, et cetera, can show how our genetics, our hormones, our brains all affect how much we feel fear and what we do about it. Um, so, and remember, it's on a continuum. We have people who are more closed. They find uncertainty harder to tolerate. Um, and we all know people like that. Indeed, if we have children, we will know we have differences in our children. There are some people who have a greater need to have order and security. And that's often a part, indeed, of our children's lives. I have grandchildren. And certainly the toddlerhood is around getting some order. So if you say something is broken, I call it the broken biscuit syndrome. They like order. Where's the whole biscuit gone? And if you say something is this, a ship, and they say, no, it's a boat, you'll realize they're trying to order things in their minds. Well, some people have a greater need for that throughout their lives. And they often are more likely to support things like capital punishment, defense spending, to be anti-immigration and pro-segregation policies. It doesn't dictate their political choices, but often it influences their political choices. So you'll see in the United States, where we've done a lot of these studies, people like that are more likely to vote Republican. And then we look at those who are, can tolerate uncertainty more easily, more open, more curious. They actually like excitement, they seek novelties, et cetera. And they're more likely to be flexible and to alter their responses when they see it's necessary, okay? These are often genetically based. I mean, we have identified a gene variant which affects dopamine and people with this gene are more likely to be open-minded people who enjoy pleasure from, as I said, variety and diversity. Um, and we can find it also through the startle response. Um, you can do this with electromyography studies where you can check how people respond to certain issues, whether it's blood or abortion or whatever. And the startle response will always tell you how conservative they are. The quicker they are to respond to a startle response, the more likely they are to support, to support policies that actually are around security. The interesting thing is we can even tell in the United States is quite funny because it took me a while to figure out that people went to different restaurants. So some people would go, for instance, to um, uh, 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 Appleby and um, so other people would go more easily to Japanese restaurants or Indian restaurants and it's actually true that people who have not who have got the DD DRD or DRD 474 gene are more likely to go to the newer kinds of restaurants to Japanese restaurants to Indian restaurants Thai restaurants etc etc whereas others will tend to go to more traditional burgers plus plus and you can all think of one person who loved the burgers who was in charge of the United States um, the other thing it's really easy to tell is in terms of child rearing, very different. Conservatives bring their children up very differently. They often believe that they really need order and they need authority. They're much more likely to be in charge of um, corporate punishment and to spank their children. Liberals tend to trust their children much more. They trust they'll be fine. Don't need to worry too much about them. You know, they'll come right in the end. So some people say, in fact, the quickest way to tell whether somebody is conservative or liberal is actually look at how they look at their child rearing. Since I suspect I'm probably talking to a lot of liberals, I have to tell you that um, the happiness quotient is less in liberals and conservatives do tend to be more contented. Liberals, however, do tend to have very messy deaths. 
Now, those of you who are surprised that um, things like genetics can actually inform opinions, have a look at this um, uh, slide when you get a chance. And I'm going to suggest, by the way, uh, Leah, if you wouldn't mind that we could send out these PowerPoints to people afterwards, because I'm fitting a lot into it. But this is an extraordinary PowerPoint that shows you how much genetic influences different beliefs, like punishment attitudes, as opposed to how a shared environment, which might be a family, can influence them, and a unique environment, which might be, for instance, the university that they go to. And people have actually done enough tests, they think, to be able to say how these things will affect their attitudes towards, for instance, religion, sex, racial attitudes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing to remember, it is not that one kind of person is different to another. We speculate, and I tend to tend towards evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary wise, you do actually need to have different kinds of people with different types of predispositions. And I, I can give it to you like this. So just imagine a tribe where there was one person who said, oh, I see the tiger. I'm going to go, I'm going to uh, shoot or shoot my arrow at the tiger. And somebody says, hold on a second. I see there are more tracks here. There's more than one tiger here. So we need to be careful. So you actually do need a real balance between those who are conservative and those who are more interested in novelty and perhaps not as, as careful as, as, the, as those who are conservatives. The thing I know now that I didn't know was that conservatism is really the majority norm through history. So every society you work in, do not be surprised that conservatism is actually where most people are. They've needed it. It's things that worked, that have worked, that they're alive and that they're here as a group. We do think that there has been an openness in, in uh, openness towards liberalism. And we think it's actually because societies that are, are becoming less deadly today and I know some of you are probably undertaking some um, human rights classes with uh, Professor David. And I do know that, for instance, it's interesting to see that it's Western societies that are more wealthy are actually, believe it or not, and uh, taking the time and the care to actually even think about human rights. You often find them less obvious, except by people who've been outside of a very conservative country. So there is something in terms of the less dangerous a society is, the more, the more we can think about um, uh, liberalism. And the other thing to remember is that everybody is predisposed and not predestined. So people can become more open, they can become more liberal. However, it can be much more difficult to affect some people than others because of their basic nature. Now, the next thing to think, think very carefully through is that it seems we have evolved for cooperation, and I'll get back to that, but only with some people and not with everyone. And I'm thinking in terms of the arguments of the European Union as to who do they share the vaccine with. And I think they realized that if the vaccine was a free for all and um, countries within the European were to go and buy what they wanted and use up all the supplies, Germany would use it up before Belgium, et cetera, that frankly, it would have broken the European Union apart. So they did decide to go for a shared approach as part of the European Union. And that, of course, it means that, frankly, I'm been in jail, I've been got my job earlier than you because I happen to live in a part of the UK. But it does probably mean that they have preserved the identity of the European Union. But remember, they didn't really begin to think about vaccines for the rest of the world who are less wealthy and less able to have vaccines than sometime on in the process. And even people were saying fairly delicately, you know, we do have to think about people who aren't as wealthy as us, don't we? And the reason, um, the reason um, belonging or, you know, it's the second most vital human need after basic food and shelter. And those of you who studied Kohlberg as part of education will know this. Um, the need to belong is critical to a lot of our um, identities. Um, those of you who came to university recently may remember, in fact, with COVID, it's been very difficult to find a group to belong to. So a lot of the joy belonging to different groups has probably been taken from you because of uh, the circumstances of the last year. And though some of you may be getting it through uh, Zooms and, and other ways of, of connecting, but it is a really a vital need. And most people feel that other people belong more than they do. And I could go into this, but I did discover some of my own research that often it's people who aren't quite sure that they're being part of a group will often be, become more radical in terms of their political instincts. Um, so you often have people at the edges of groups who often seem to be much more radical because they want to belong to a group. And that can actually be um, a problem. 
And it's particularly a problem for us in our field in diasporas, because diasporas tend to be on the edge and to prove themselves to be really Irish, really Tamil, um, really whatever. And they will often emphasize um, uh, policies that actually are problematic in our field because they tend to belong to uh, uh, pro uh, uh, policies that are probably validating violence, etc. So many of us are passionately committed to our group, and that's for very good reasons. Um, all the in-group feelings are very rewarding. It's very hard to move outside of them. It's very hard in a conflict to move outside of them, not least because you often will find yourself in danger. So one of the biggest challenges we have, those of us in peace, in peace building, is that we're actually not only trying to change people's minds, but people's emotions and lives. So what you do might mean that somebody will get into trouble because, for instance, if a riot starts a few weeks later, do you instinctively go there with the rest of your group or do you say, oh, I'm not so sure this is a good thing, and then probably you will come in for some hostile feelings. Um, and often those of you who play sport, you know that feeling, what it's like to be part of a group when you marry um, testosterone and oxytocin. Um, it is quite spectacular. And that's, of course, why sport is so addictive, both for those who play it and those who are looking at it from a distance. <clears throat> now, we used to think that people understood each other through um, listening to people. But in fact, we've discovered that, in fact, we understand each other through neurons that are called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons actually enable us to, to sort of get inside other people's minds and empathize with other people. They're the basis of all empathy. However, unfortunately, empathy is more easily felt for one's own group. And this is the problem because belonging to a group almost always brings up some sort of group that actually will be uh, the other, the enemy. And that is a real problem because one of the pieces, I've done an awful lot of work in, in say the Middle East. I've done work in Sri Lanka where you're talking about Sinhalese and Tamils, Northern Ireland. Uh, if one group perceives the other to actually be more powerful than they are, it's very difficult for them to perceive empathy for them. So let me give you an example. If I bring together Israelis and Palestinians, uh, by and large, the Palestinians see the Israelis as having much more power than they are. So if you bring them together, the Israelis are much more likely, liberal Israelis to emphasize, liberal Israeli Jews to emphasize with Palestinians because they really want to understand. And actually you can see their mirror neurons working on their trying to understand. However, when you look at the mirror neurons of the Palestinians, they find it difficult to understand if the Israelis talk about, you know, buses that were blown up, about the number of people that have been killed by Palestinians, et cetera. When they feel empathy, it's when they understand, when they see the Israeli Jews as actually listening to them. So when they're being heard. And this is the same. It explains why in my first few years in doing group work in Northern Ireland, there would always come a time, and often it was the middle of the night and you were exhausted, where the Catholics would say, well, look, we're not really interested in understanding you. We're interested in sharing power and getting power. Whereas the Protestants would say, we want to understand Catholics, but they wouldn't put so much emphasis on equality. So these things are important for the way in which we do our work. As I say, belonging requires a sense of others. And here is um, a cartoon that was seen very commonly in the 19th century in many of the um, British publications. For those of us who were Irish, were seen as apes. This dehumanization of people from people to animals is actually very common in conflicts. And I even saw one last year when I saw one that um, emphasized it was where Hillary Clinton was obviously a few years ago, was the, um, con the candidate against Trump. And here it says KFC, by the way, is a very conservative restaurant for those who are conservative. Hillary special, two fat thighs with small breast and a left wing. And they had just brought what they had basically said is they had dehumanized Hillary Clinton to be a, a chicken. Again, for those of you uh, who are interested in human rights issues, fairness does seem to be a thing that's felt physically. And I could go through all the ex all the sort of um, uh, all the ex experiments that we've done on this, including monkeys. Monkeys can actually feel unfairness, and we're quite near to them. We often don't realize it. Um, but it's particularly when there's horizontal inequalities. Um, a woman called Frances Stewart did some of the best research for our field, which basically showed it's not poverty per se that causes conflict. It's poverty that's allied to an identity that is then allied to a certain kind of leadership. 
that actually leads to conflict. So when we feel um, left out as ter in terms of our group identity, that's in fact when most of the new conflicts of the world today have started, most of them. The other thing I want to say, and this is leads in with the fact that um, the thing to remember as I say all of this is basically what a lot of what it adds up to is a context will define how people will respond. So you'll see there, you'll have the balloons talking about all the good things that many people, you included, are probably fighting for in a society. Respect, participation, <clears throat> equality. Well, when you do have a society like that, you are much less likely to have conflict. And I'll come back to that in the end. Now, the other thing we often don't really notice, we keep talking about fake facts. Truth is actually in the brain. And the whole question of who is right I have a lovely experiment where we asked in a lot of countries, we asked um, who committed 9-11. And we polled six, over 16,000 people from 17 nations. And they found that only nine of those believed that Al-Qaeda carried out the attacks, which was probably what you believed, okay? And actually go back and have a look at this. This tells you what different uh, countries believed, who believed what. And we'll think, try and think of a reason why they wouldn't believe it was Al-Qaeda. So when asked who was responsible, Indonesians, Jordanians, Pakistanis, Egyptians, uh, they believed that Arabs carried out 9-11. Um, OK, only that percentage believed they carried it out. And I actually had a funny incident where I was out to dinner with the Pakistani general in, in Boston because I forget I was with the group. And he I said to him, um, who believes in um, Pakistan that was Al-Qaeda or do they believe somebody else? And he said, no, he said, um, people don't believe it was um, the Arabs who did it. He said, we all think the Arabs are too stupid to do it. And I thought, oh my God, this is another, of course, form of it's in, in terms of prejudice that groups can have. 43% of Egyptians believed it was Israel who did it. Okay, guess why? 36% of Turks, believed it was the US government. 26% of British said they didn't know. Now that may seem strange to you until I tell you 20% of US citizens still don't believe Obama was born in the USA. 50% of Republicans believe he wasn't. And nearly 30% of Americans believe he is a Muslim, including 43% of Republicans. I actually have met Northern Ireland loyalists who believe the Battle of the Boyne which took place in 1690, is enshrined in the Christian Bible. And many US Christians believe that Jesus is actually mentioned in the constitution. And the final one that's just become obvious in the last few weeks, many of Trump supporters now believe that it was Antifa, the left, who led and encouraged the assault on the US Capitol in January the 6th. And you may think to yourself, how can they believe that? But they believe it because they need to because most people need to belong to a group more than they need to be right. Most group beliefs come from uh, group needs. <clears throat> I would have 40 new students every year in Boston, and they were all international students, mostly in their 30s, and 30% 30 were Muslim, 30% roughly were Christian, the rest were Buddhist, Hindus, etc. And after we'd established who came from what different faith, you would, I would ask them, what, how come you all believe differently? And they would all look a bit puzzled because they had thought they believed differently because they believe the truth. <clears throat> but in fact, the reality was most people believe because of where they are born. And it can be almost any framework where they're born will actually um, inform these beliefs. Uh, and by the way, before you think I'm knocking something like religion, I am not, because people with deeply held faith are actually happier. And I was just saying to a neighbor recently, I wish I had a deeply held faith because I might be happier too, because liberals um, by their nature are often questioning, much more questioning, whereas those who have a deep held faith are, um, find it easier. Um, and this was where the, the study, I, I mentioned the study, it found that people who, when they're faced with people, different things for their beliefs, they actually freeze. And most of us do all we can to protect our group beliefs. I'm sure you do too. Uh, it's driven by the sort of um, social media um, sites that you look at. It's by newspapers. Most of us would choose to read The Guardian or The Telegraph. If we're in Israel, we read Har Haaretz or Jerusalem Post. And um, if you're in actually New York Times or The Washington Post, that should be not The Washington Times because The Washington Post is a conservative one. 
And we actually defend these um, ideologies, not necessarily because they're right, because two things, they address our psychological needs, or in many cases, they address our material needs, such as low taxes. We always think other people are, are more violent than we are. And our members serve our current needs. And I explain this by saying, those of you who are with a long-term partner or even a short-term partner, and the arguments come up and something happens and something is not done and you suddenly remembered um, and you didn't do this a month ago when such and such happened or a year ago when such and such happened or if you're married as long as I am, 30 years ago. And your memory brings up all the things that you need about the other person to actually, as it were, validate what you're saying about them. Now, I haven't really time to go in, much time to go into the whole question of extremism, but just to say that one of the things that we find about extremists is there are very few psychopaths. We do think that some of the US extremists who are loners uh, have those characteristics, but mostly they are normal people. Mostly they're young and male. It's rarely about religious beliefs. And um, if you watch ISIS, people who go to join ISIS, they often have Islam for dummies in their rucksack. They don't really know that much about Islam sometimes for practical reasons, if they live in the Middle East, sometimes they're forced. Often it's about finding a tribe to belong to, becoming a hero, sexual rewards, attractions, et cetera, and for women, somewhat different reasons. But you have to understand what these reasons are if you're actually going to find a way through to stop people becoming conscripted so easily. Um, and this is a photograph, in a way, young men who couldn't, this is the first story I told, young men who joined the IRA because they couldn't get jobs in Northern Ireland, young men who joined the British Army because they couldn't get jobs. Now, my PhD was on um, paramilitaries who changed because I was interested in why they changed. And almost all of them said to me they'd never felt more alive when out with their active service units um, and killing people. And they, they admitted they were ashamed to say it. And they missed actually being part of that group. And you'll find many soldiers actually miss, um, unfortunately, a lot of them close up because things have been so awful where they have, if they've been in Iran or Afghanistan or, or in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever. But it does give meaning to people's lives. And those of you who are interested, um, Chris Hedges has a great book, A War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. Now, I'm not going to go through leadership. I did write, as Professor David said, a book on Trump. If you go to Amazon, you only have to read the first chapter. It's all on Amazon and it's a whole summary of the book. But it's basically helping us to understand why people go for somebody like President Trump. And the basic thing is in that first quote, most of us need somebody who is loud, strong and powerful for us, for us. And again, if you look at the um, biology, our choices are influenced again by our genetics, how we feel fear, our hormones, et cetera, et cetera. Low self-esteem, for instance, is means that you're very vulnerable to an autocratic uh, leader. Ve one very interesting thing is actually a lot of people would prefer their leader to be strong rather than to be right. So they may not believe in his policies, but the fact that he or occasionally she um, is, is, is strong is something they uh, appreciate. And we think this is because that certainly mattered in, in, in years gone by. You haven't time now, but if you look at those faces, there are very few about rationality, you know. They have fallen in love with somebody who validates them, who doesn't look down on them, who says he hears them, and somebody they'd like to have a drink with. They couldn't imagine themselves having a drink in a bar with either Hillary or Obama. So the processes um, whereby they choose um, leaders, as I say, if you read that first chapter, um, it gives you a lot of the things that actually count for people. And if you look at the third one down, psychologically immature individuals, are more likely to want authority. And some research unfortunately suggests that such morally immature, that's a biased word, individuals include between 60 to 75% of Western adults. If you look at the number of people who would like to have a strong leader, the figure is frightening. Almost one in three citizens would give up democracy to have a dictator. Almost one in three US citizens would give up democracy because it's too problematic for them to think about it and they'd prefer a dictator. Okay, then leaders, there are two kinds. There's transactional and transformational. And the transactional ones persuade people to set up, you know, the transactional leaders are people who can say, I'm going to be responsible for all of you. Oh, sorry, transactional leaders say, I'm going to serve you, my group. Transformational leaders say, I'm going to serve all groups. And of course, therefore, you will see somebody like Biden after he is elected saying, 
you know, I want to serve everybody, those who voted for me and those who didn't. I don't think I remember Trump saying that. Very hard to find these leaders. I remember supervising a project in Kosovo, Afghanistan and Sierra Leone about 20 years ago. People were beginning to look to new kinds of politics. We tried to find um, leaders who were transformational and frankly, we couldn't find them. Um, culture is something you also have to be very careful about. Um, and for instance, I found it in terms of when I was working with, say, I remember working with a group of Israeli and Palestinian journalists in Boston, and a big argument uh, broke out about the Israelis wanted to take a collective photograph. And they didn't realize that in fact, this is really problematic for Palestinians who are very much more a collective culture. It's shifting somewhat. They're a collective culture. Israelis are individual cultures. So for the Israelis to be seen having discussions with Palestinians is probably seen as, you know, Maybe some people would see it as useless. Maybe some people would applaud it. For Palestinians, there really would be a slight worry about uh, that sort of kind of cooperation unless people know what it's about. Same in Iraq <clears throat> culture, the American military went AWOL. I mean, it was crazy what they did those first few years until they got some military training, bringing dogs into the houses of people who were Muslim, the way they treated women, et cetera, et cetera. Took four years and by that stage, they had lost the war. Um, similarly, I find myself, I have to turn down things because I'm not old enough and I'm not male enough in some of the UN missions, because these are the things that matter. So there are different um, cultures. Um, in in the, the more open cultures, it's about rationality. Um, you know people, it's, you don't worry so much about um, problems of conflict, it's seen as normal. Uh, if you're in a high context one, conflict is not seen as normal. It's often who you know. It's often communicated without that many words, and you often have people who is the authority. And therefore, the whole question of the outsider is much more problematic in a situation like that. And if you're doing our work, you have to realize that. Okay, so if you have time to go back and you can see which cultures are individualist and you can see which cultures are collectivist. Ireland, I think, tends to be somewhere in the middle for various reasons I won't go into, but I think we do tend to be people who we know are quite, quite a small nation. U.S. writes most of the book on books on negotiation and mediation, but that's a real problem. Now, I know, I'm, I'm just going to race through this because this is basically uh, social media is changing everything about wars, everything. Wars are being won or lost, and you can look through, it's the Buddhists, it's the, in Iraq, everywhere. People are winning or losing wars by using Facebook, sometimes just to get donations, sometimes just to stroke up fear, sometimes just to get people in the West involved, etc. And if you look at the chemistry there that I've noted, um, if you go back and have a look at it, it is really problematic because social media favors conservative, favors radical ideas, it favors negative ideas, it favors people getting into a tiny group and huddling together, it does not favor openness, unfortunately. Uh, in fact, the more partisan a person is, the more followers they'll attract on social media. So that is really difficult. Um, so the good news is, yes, we do. We are, as human beings, capable of cooperating. Otherwise, we would never have got to where we are in our nations. Um, leaders uh, persuade people to cooperate with each other through flags, parades, uh, sports, et cetera, et cetera. So we have been able to move beyond our uh, particular smaller tribe to bigger ones. Whether we can do that in terms of what's happening in the world, I'm not totally sure. So. Those of you who are interested um, might go back and um, think about this, that if we base our, our uh, strategies on understanding some of these um, psychological and biosocial processes, we're more likely to be successful. In other words, work with, working with the realities of human natures and not the way we'd like our nature to be. Now, I want to give you time for questions, but if you get a chance, you might go back and see what this means in terms of strategies that take emotions into account. Don't bother too much with fact checking. It's often about emotions rather than facts. And don't, sometimes it's hard to believe that people believe what they do, but it often is that they do believe it, but not for the reasons you can understand. And the whole question of people need groups to belong to, and this is tied in with the whole question of why many young men have gone off to join ISIS, et cetera. And um, the 10th one there I've already said, if we ensure societies where people are at their best uh, and not their worst, it really helps. Lowest crime rates are seen in countries which have very effective law enforcement, social welfare systems, and restrictive gun laws. So in fact, we could just change the context rather than looking for evil people. Um, and just remember, above all, individual and social change 
is possible. It's just people change in different ways.